They clapped his family, so he took revenge. Meet Clyde Shelton, a Philadelphia engineer and a happily family man waiting for some fried chicken delivery. Uh-oh, not so happy anymore. Looks like someone's gonna get fried, and it won't be chicken. Two bandits hit the man with a baseball bat and tie him up, robbing the place and almost leaving when one of the fellas gets some other ideas. Unfortunately, Clyde's family comes out. His wife and daughter are no longer in the movie. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. At least the burglars knife down Clyde too, so he won't live the rest of his life in self-pity regret, and mental disease. But fortunately, or not, Clyde survived. Now we meet a career-minded prosecutor, Nick Rice. He breaks the news on the case. One burglar testified on the other one, so the loser who got betrayed has the death penalty. As far as the other one, the judge doubts Clyde's words because he was blacked out during the crime, so the bad guy is only being sentenced for five years. Nick suggests that Clyde should take the deal because the defense might win. He's also interested in maintaining his 96% conviction rate, more than justice. So Darby, the guy who did all the worst, will be charged only five years for a robbery. Clyde is left feeling betrayed. I wonder why. Nick goes home with a win. What can he say? He's got a family to provide for and a soon-to-be-born daughter. And he's a coward. Ten years pass and Nick is a happy father of a ten-year-old daughter. Ames, the betrayed burglar, gets executed via lethal injection. However, due to a change in the chemicals, he stops living in agonizing pain. Just how we like it. Someone corrupted the machine. Once it gets inspected, police find a bottle of chemicals and the words written on it. Can't fight fate. That's what Darby said to Clyde right before he clapped his family. Poetic. Darby is now out, doing just three years in prison. He's now enjoying extracurricular activities. Relatable. Suddenly, Darby gets a call from a mysterious caller who warns him about the coming police. He also tells him to get rid of the pistol he just used to shoot the cavalry of police because that wasn't the smartest move. The caller indicates a gun Darby can use to his advantage. It's in the cop's car, and the cop is tasered. If he wants to escape, he should go there. Nice, a mysterious archangel. How lucky are you, Darby? I guess karma is working in reverse today. Darby finds the cop, wakes him up, and they escape. At the safe place, he's ready to take out the cop. But before that, he gets a call from his savior. Ouch. Here's the twist. Turns out it's the same fella, Mr. Clyde. Darby tries to shoot him with the pistol. Oh, here's another twist. It's a trick gun that injects him with a paralyzing agent. He's unable to move, but fully conscious. Oh, you know what happens next. Sweet mother of revenge. Clyde straps him in for the ride of his life, and he even brings a mirror. Wow, I've seen this once in a motel, and I instantly enjoyed it. You can't fight fate, says Clyde, and the party begins. Later, we find that Darby was found in 25 pieces in a warehouse owned by Clyde. I guess he was made out of Lego. Nick and his team suspect Clyde. Yeah, yeah, he is indeed sussy. The next day, a SWAT unit bursts into Clyde's house. Finally, he's been waiting for it the whole day. Clyde doesn't resist the arrest either. And he's in his birthday suit. Weird flex, but okay. And I'm not sure you'll do okay this way in jail, but as you wish. Probably didn't want the dirty cops to steal his drip. While inspecting the house, Nick finds lots of law books and a picture of himself. The news shot from when he made a deal with Darby. Well, guess we know Clyde's intentions. Nick goes to interrogate Clyde. Meanwhile, Nick's family is at home and they get a package. The girl's concert on tape, which Nick had no time to visit because of his job. The concert, you say? Well, that's a good show indeed. The girl starts watching the DVD and calls mom. Yep, I know. I also wanted to cry when I saw what they did with the Saw series. Tragic. In an interrogation, Nick overtly congratulates him for removing Darby from society, then asks for a confession. By all appearances, he seems cooperative. Clyde confesses that he wanted to kill both Barbie, I mean Darby, and Ames. It's not quite a confession because he just said he wanted to, not that he did. Gotcha. However, Clyde does offer a full confession in exchange for a deluxe bed in his cell. Whoa, that's a hard bargain. Nick says no. He wants the same bed for himself. Understandable. Meanwhile, Nick gets a call from his wife who's terrified of the home video tape made by Clyde. Oh, come on. It was average. Trust me. Just watch She-Hulk. It's way worse. Finally, the team promises to get a nice bed for Clyde, so he promises to confess and goes to jail. At the hearing, Nick denies giving Clyde bail. Then Clyde opposes a motion to deny himself bail, citing obscure legal precedents. Whoa, there were so many legal terms, I just lost it. It's like every time I listen to Ben Shapiro. Not everyone finished Oxford. I know I didn't. Not even high school. Nick brings up the confession, but Clyde says he only promised to give a confession. The judge realizes that Nick is a fool, and he was tricked, so she agrees to give Clyde bail. This makes Clyde amused. Huh, so you're gonna give a man accused of two clappings bail just because he threw around a few legal terms? Clyde tells Mrs. Judge that he remembers her. Describing this in the nicest way possible, he basically tells her she sucks at her job. She gets offended down to her soul and gets Clyde removed for contempt of court. That was fun. Now we're back in jail. So you got the mattress, Clyde? Where's the confession? Clyde is an honest man and confesses to taking out both Ames and Darby, saying what he did with them in vivid details. But Clyde wants another bargain. The mattress is not enough. He also wants Chipotle with hot sauce served today precisely at 1 p.m. and an iPod. In return, he will give the location of Bill Reynolds, Darby's attorney, who was reported missing three days before. Now that sounds like a tasty deal. The Chipotle arrives eight minutes late because Mr. Warden, the prison chef, decides to become bossy out of the blue and demands multiple precautions. Clyde is disappointed. Yeah, I hate my Chipotle served cold too. Clyde gives up on the coordination, and Nick with Detective Dunnigan finds Reynolds. Buried alive, only minutes dead. Looks like the delay caused him to suffocate because his oxygen tank was set to shut off at 1.15. Damn timing. Meanwhile, Clyde Selmay wants some Chipotle too, and he's deadly serious about his intentions. How serious? 
school breaking serious. Clyde gives in and shares a stake with him, enjoying small talk. Seems like he's setting up a long-term friendship. He even gives him the remote to the iPod. But all the meanwhile, he's getting ready to do something. And he claps him with the T-bone. Darn, friendship ruined. Though, for a stake that good, I gotta admit, I would've clapped him too. Clyde gets sent to solitary confinement, and it seems like his story is over. Or maybe not. Nick's assistant Sarah finds evidence of contract payments to Clyde from the Department of Defense. So the head of the DA, Jones Cantrell, takes Nick to meet a CIA operative, Bray, who worked with Clyde. We learned Clyde was once a CIA brain, and he was terrific, working in a black ops think tank on extraordinary methods of killing targets. Remember Kennedy? That was him. Kurt Cobain? Yeah, him too. The man is a born tactician. A man with a plan, if you would. Assume he can see and hear you all the time. Yes, you too. You at home without pants watching this video on YouTube. So it seems that Clyde is in jail because he wants to be in jail, and each thing he does has a deeper meaning. When Nick asks how they should deal with Clyde, Ray says there's only one way. Delete him. Otherwise, they cannot stop him. From what you ask? Well, there are more targets on Clyde's revenge spree. Nick and Jonas convince Judge Laura Birch to violate Shelton's civil rights and restrict his visiting privileges. Playing with the law again? I'm on it, Laura says. Then she answers a call, which explodes, killing her instantly. Wow, should have used a smartphone. Those kill you slowly, not explosively. At the prison, Nick confronts Clyde. He states that vengeance won't bring his family back, but Clyde says this is not an act of revenge on particular people. It's revenge on the failed justice system. So here's the final deal Clyde offers. Release him by 6 a.m. tomorrow, or he'll take out everyone. This guy's going full Joker mode. We truly do live in a society. The whole justice office goes on a night shift, picking on Clyde and trying to find his cooperatives, and they're unsuccessful. So they simply wait until 6 a.m. with their eyes steady on the clocks, just like me waiting for food to be ready in the microwave. So it's 6, and nothing happens. Fine. Cheer up, team. Let's go home. The team gets in their cars, and do I really gotta say it? Boom. Their cars go off and kill those inside, including Sarah. Rip in peace. Remember what Clyde said? It's not about vengeance anymore. It's about the cold Chipotle, <laughs> or something like that. Nick and Jonas visit the mayor, who gets angry and scared without offering help. I'm really hoping she's the next to go, but at least she gives the boy some security. Plus, Nick sends his family somewhere far away from himself. Yep, a maniac inside jail taking out everyone. Great excuse to drink some beers all alone, Nick. He goes inside his house, ready to grab one, and sees a photo of himself with Darby. Someone was there. Nick sets up a meeting with Clyde, just to beat him up and work out the nerves. Dunnigan gets some licks in, too. They almost take out Clyde, but stop at the last second. Clyde promises to bring the whole system down. Good job, Nick. Look what you've done. Cold Chipotle? Now this? If only you would've apologized. At Sarah's funeral, a mysterious man wearing black clothing powers up a remote-controlled drone holding a rocket launcher and a 50 caliber machine gun. Someone's on a kill streak. It kills Jonas dead, and then he dies. In the aftermath, the mayor makes Nick acting district attorney. Promotion? What a kind surprise. Bring the gag. The mayor's got the whole of Gotham, I mean Philly, closed. What can I say? Clyde does deliver quite the message. Nick goes on a 24-7 investigation to find out who's helping Clyde. Suddenly, he finds out that Clyde owns a garage next to his prison. Nick and Dunnigan arrive at the garage, and while looking around, they find, you'll never believe it, a tunnel system leading to the solitary confinement cells, a huge supply of armaments, and Chipotle. He had it all the time, apparently, over the past 10 years. Clyde had dug the tunnel system from his garage to the prison. What is this, Minecraft? When it was finished, he deliberately had himself arrested and sent to solitary confinement, so he could sneak out of prison and kill undetected, all by himself, and then sneak back into his cell. Imagine the face of this genius if he would have landed in another jail. Dunnigan opens a small hole and finds that it leads to Clyde's cell, which is empty. Meanwhile, disguised as a janitor, Clyde plants a cell phone activated napalm bomb in City Hall. Nick, Dunnigan, and Detective Garza entered the fifth floor and find the bomb directly under the sixth floor, where the mayor is at a security meeting. What a coincidence. At the same time, Clyde gets out of town hall and back to his cell. Ain't no better place than home, huh? The detective attempts to disarm the bomb but fails and warns the team to leave it alone. They decide not to tell the mayor what is going on, as Clyde can watch and will detonate the bomb if he gets detected. Clyde returns to his cell and look whom he found. Nick, have a seat, man. Would you like some cold Chipotle? Clyde offers one last deal, but Nick says he no longer makes deals with bad guys, which Clyde appreciates. After all, that was his intention all along, to teach Nick a lesson. Nick tells Clyde that if he detonates the bomb, it's a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your life. But what's a life with no wife, no daughter, and meals served eight minutes late and cold? So Clyde detonates the napalm bomb anyway. Nick exits and locks his cell. Like I said, it's a decision you'll have to live with for the rest of your life, which I think now has about 25 seconds left to go. Nick flees the building while Detective Dunnigan seals the hatch in the back of the cell to ensure Clyde doesn't escape. Clyde realizes that the bomb was placed under his cell, smiles, and stares thoughtfully at a bracelet his daughter had made for him, which says, Daddy. Clyde reunites with his family. I wonder what they'll think of all the innocent people he clapped. Nick walks away without looking at the explosion. Of course, he's alpha. In the final scene, Nick attends his daughter's music recital. He rises with the crowd as they cheer her on after the performance. Moral of the story? We live in a society.